Hello everyone. Today in our series of Docplex SQL interviews, we have with us Professor Dr. Hope Rugo, who is one of the leading global figures in the fight against breast cancer. Dr. Rugo is a professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Rugo is on the forefront of the fight against advanced and chemotherapy resistant breast cancer. Recipient of several grants like the Common Funding Award, Dr. Rugo has also authored over 200 international publications in the field of oncology and hematology. Thank you Dr. Rugo for speaking with us today. Thanks, it's a pleasure. Can you please tell us some new directions in HER2 positive breast cancer? This is actually a really interesting area. You know, we made tremendous progress with the use of trastuzumab in both early and late stage breast cancer improving survival. Uh, in both situations quite impressively and with quite modest toxicity. Uh, and now that we understand how to combine this antibody, uh, we've been able to make even further improvements both in the neoadjuvant, adjuvant, and metastatic settings. Then we saw the development of new antibodies as well as oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, the first on the uh, scene was actually lapatinib, an oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor against HER2 and EGFR, uh, which did show some improvement over giving chemotherapy alone in the metastatic setting, but had some toxicity, including diarrhea, similar to EGFR inhibitors as a, a class. Uh, then, uh, really, the next thing that cha- really rocked the world of treating HER2-positive breast cancer was pertuzumab, uh, the antibody that blocks heterodimerization. It's interesting because we would think that pertuzumab alone would work very well because it blocks heterodimer formation, which seems to be a more active signaling complex than trastuzumab, which only blocks homodimers. But it turned out that trastuzumab was still better, and so it makes us believe that the synergy is really important and that both drugs have an important immune action, uh, something called ADCC. And this is actually this antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity is an important part of the mechanism. I think uh, somewhat to a surprise to all of us, the combination of pertuzumab and trastuzumab with chemotherapy as first-line therapy for metastatic HER2-positive breast cancer, particularly in patients who'd never seen prior trastuzumab, resulted in a dramatic improvement in overall survival, even better than the significant improvement in progression-free survival, again, with very little toxicity, mainly diarrhea, which generally could be well-controlled. And then in the neoadjuvant setting, the addition of pertuzumab to standard chemotherapy with trastuzumab and ataxane improved pathologic complete response rates, which led to an accelerated approval in that setting by the U.S. FDA. We're now waiting results from the adjuvant affinity trial, which randomized patients to receive standard chemotherapy with trastuzumab or trastuzumab and pertuzumab, and these results are incredibly important. We hope to see results in 2017. The next thing that happened actually was TDM1 or trastuzumab amptansine. And this is a very interesting uh, chemotherapy uh, linked to an antibody, so uh, so-called a, a stealth toxin. Uh, and these these kinds of uh, drug uh, conjugated, conjugated to antibodies are increasingly popular and are really dependent on having a target that you can, that you have a good antibody to that can be the carrier pigeon uh, bringing the uh, payload to the cell itself. So uh, in TDM1, trastuzumab is linked with a very important and well-constructed linker to uh, amtansine, a, a derivative of uh, metensin. And uh, that actually uh, complex seems to effectively deliver this nasty drug that's very potent at a small concentration to the cancer cell and uh, actually improved both progression-free and overall survival compared to lapatinib and capecitabine in patients whose cancers had progressed on trastuzumab and chemotherapy in the second-line metastatic setting. Uh, in addition, trastuzumab amptansine appears to, at least in some patients, cross the blood-brain barrier and have some activity against CNS metastases, which is quite intriguing. So where we are with TDM1, of course, was then thinking, well, you don't lose your hair with that drug, and it's every three weeks, and blood counts, you know, little liver enzyme 
abnormalities, a little drop in platelets, but it's pretty well tolerated. So uh, maybe we could move it to the early stage setting. Uh, there is an ongoing trial called the ATTEMPT trial in patients who have stage 1 HER2 positive breast cancer that's randomizing patients 3 to 1 to receive TDM1 for a year, which is a lot of therapy, uh, versus weekly paclitaxel for 12 weeks with a year of trastuzumab, the so-called APT regimen uh, that we published uh, run by the Dana-Farber group uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and then TDM1 also was thought of as potentially a substitute to the combination of trastuzumab and ataxane. So it's actually an intriguing idea. You could take the same kind of drugs, at, at microtubule active agent and trastuzumab, not lose your hair, get it every three weeks, and maybe that would be just as good. So a recent neoadjuvant trial called the Christine study actually found that that combination of TDM1 and pertuzumab was inferior to getting paclitaxel, trastuzumab, and uh, pertuzumab. So really uh, quite intriguing, looking at pathologic complete response as the endpoint. Uh, in contrast, our iSPY2 neoadjuvant trial showed that pertuzumab and TDM1 followed by AC was actually better than paclitaxel, trastuzumab, uh, pertuzumab followed by AC. But again, this is a phase two uh, exploratory trial. So I, I think that what we come up with was the, is that TDM1 is, seems to be important, um, and there may be patients who can receive TDM1 and don't need to get the taxane chemotherapy. Uh, but we don't exactly know who those patients are, but we hope to identify them. The addition of pertuzumab to TDM1 doesn't appear to provide much uh, additional benefit. So, uh, you know, really we're looking to the adjuvant setting to try and help us answer further questions about how to optimize treatment for HER2-positive disease. But then the whole next area is where do we go from there? There are still patients who have upfront resistance or develop resistance, CNS metastases are an issue, and there are a whole host of oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are being studied, as well as some very intriguing correlative science work that's being done to try and better understand who benefits from what therapy. In terms of the oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, there are a number of agents that are in clinical trials. ONT380 has shown some activity against CNS metastases, which is quite uh, interesting, and there are a number of other agents, poziotinib, uh, some other agents that have uh, been tested in trials and not succeeded. Uh, and then, of course, the drug I think that's closest to potentially being approved is neratinib. Neratinib is similar to lapatinib, but it's a, a more potent tyrosine kinase inhibitor against HER2 and EGFR. Its use and development has been really limited by diarrhea. Um, and in the metastatic setting, that's limited its use so much that it hasn't been superior to its comparator in any of its trials. Uh, and so... Actually, a, a, you know, the whole idea was that maybe it would allow non-cross resistance. So in patients who'd already received trastuzumab, still didn't have recurrence, if you gave them neratinib, would you be able to prevent recurrence by sort of attacking HER2 by another angle? Uh, and in, certainly in preclinical studies, that's been the case. Uh, so a trial called the Extinet trial, which was sort of tortured during its, uh, 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 existence actually tested uh, this neratinib versus placebo in patients who'd received about a year of adjuvant trastuzumab. And over the course of the trial, the uh, drug was owned by three different companies, and the trial kept being changed. And they also understood that if they only treated all comers, they wouldn't have enough events. You know, people do pretty well. So what they did was try and skew the trial over the course of the study to patients who had higher risk disease, a lot of disease after neoadjuvant therapy or high stage cancer. And what they found intriguingly was that the addition of neratinib to uh, the sort of ongoing therapy in patients with HER2 positive breast cancer for a year after a year of trastuzumab uh, improved disease-free survival, but by a modest amount, only a little more than 2%, about 2.4%. But if they looked at the ER-positive cohort, that difference increased to over 4%, and both were statistically significant. And to me, that suggests that com continuing the combination of HER2-directed therapy and potentially this alternate agent with hormone therapy helps to overcome resistance to hormone therapy and resistance to HER2-targeted therapy and improves outcome in patients with high-risk disease. So they're waiting for longer-term outcome and submitting to the FDA for approval, and at the same time, doing some very rigorous trials to try and reduce the toxicity because everybody, almost everybody who takes neratinib gets diarrhea, and it can be very, very serious 
grade three, grade four diarrhea. So they're looking at a lot of different ways, you know, certainly prophylactic anti-diarrheal therapy is critical, but trying to find treatment that's well tolerated and effective in controlling the diarrhea is going to be critical in using neuratinib moving forward. Can you please shed some light on what's going on with PARP inhibitors in breast cancer? So the story about PARP inhibitors is, of course, shorter than that with, of HER2 positive therapy, but uh, and really just because it's even a smaller population of patients who uh, are clearly going to benefit from the approval of PARP inhibitors for breast cancer. I think it's sort of a cautionary tale and a sad one at the same uh, time because uh, there are a number of different PARP inhibitors that were on the market, and the one that was moving ahead the fastest was the IV PARP inhibitor, Iniprib, and that in a phase two trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine showed an improvement in uh, not only progression-free but also overall survival in patients receiving gemcitabine and carboplatin with aniprib versus gemcitabine and carboplatin alone who had triple negative sporadic breast cancer. So they didn't have to have had a BRCA mutation. And this was, you know, for all of us, kind of data like, uh, you know, rock star data, really exciting. We were going to change the world. And we opened up a phase three trial right away. And I had, you know, more than 20 patients enrolled within a few months, uh, and it was just incredibly hard to deliver the chemotherapy due to thrombocytopenia uh, and uh, certainly other cytopenias and toxicities. And the aniprib was difficult because it was given IV twice a week on week two, one and two, so people came back a lot. Uh, and unfortunately, those results showed that the aniprib treated arm didn't fare any better than the uh, arm receiving placebo, which was really odd. We were very surprised because we had this very positive phase two trial. And it turned out that aniprib at the doses that were being used by the small company that was developing it once it was bought by a much larger pharmaceutical company, and they were able to do some additional studies, that aniprib didn't really inhibit PARP, that didn't inhibit the PARP enzyme that's responsible for DNA repair. Uh, it does do other things that have anti-tumor effects, but through a lot of preclinical studies, they were never really able to come down upon one area where iniprib was most likely to work. It's kind of a shame because I think it is an active anti-cancer drug, uh, but it was abandoned for that reason. And I think that it was also recognized that they needed to develop an oral formulation that was going to take a lot of work. So what happened? We had already had positive phase two data with Olaparib for uh, BRCA-associated breast cancer with response rates in heavily pretreated patients who received a higher rather than lower dose. But what happened was the companies all got scared off of breast cancer. They figured PARP inhibitors didn't work in breast cancer and certainly didn't work in sporadic triple negative breast cancer. At the same time, there was a publication by Karen Gelman from Canada that looked at Olaparib in patients who had sporadic and BRCA-associated triple negative breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And what she saw was in breast cancer, the only responses were in patients who had BRCA mutations, and there were no responses in sporadic triple negative breast cancer, but they did see responses in sporadic ovarian cancer, where there is a BRCA ness and DNA damaging uh, activity going on. And clearly, in this subset of ovarian cancers, there is a group of patients whose tumors are sensitive to PARP inhibition, even though they don't harbor uh, a, you know, germline mutations in uh, BRCA genes or other DNA repair genes. Meanwhile, since that time where, you know, really all the effort was put into ovarian cancer, um, there have been a number of trials which were slowly accruing in patients who had BRCA mutations and breast cancer in combination, uh, but the field moved ahead very, very slowly. And then we saw the approval of Olaparib for ovarian cancer, and I think that sort of you know, pushed the development a little bit more. Also, the development of a very potent PARP inhibitor that traps the PARP enzyme, Talazoparib, from a company called Biomarin, which is now uh, owned by Medivation. Um, and that, I think, really spurred on some of the development. In addition, uh, we had done a neoadjuvant uh, arm of our iSPY2 trial uh, that uh, looked at uh, actually, we had an arm that looked at neuratinib and HER2 positive breast cancer and showed that neuratinib and paclitaxel had a probability of being superior to trastuzumab and paclitaxel despite toxicity. No pertuzumab was given, but um, and no trastuzumab was given in the neuratinib arm, but quite intriguing. But the first arm that came along with the neuratinib arm was viliparib and carboplatin. Viliparib is another oral PARP inhibitor, and we showed that viliparib, carboplatin, paclitaxel uh, was... Uh, 
estimated to have superior pathologic complete response rates compared to uh, paclitaxel alone, and that it was predicted to have a high chance of success in a phase three neoadjuvant trial. That data, along with the neuratinib data, was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, so you can review it in detail, but it led to a phase three trial called the Brightness Trial, which has now completed accrual, and we're anxiously awaiting results, we hope, next year in 2017. That trial actually randomized women with sporadic or BRCA-associated triple negative breast cancer to receive paclitaxel, paclitaxel carbo or paclitaxel carbo and viliparib, all placebo controlled, followed by AC and then surgery as neoadjuvant treatment. And it's a very impressive international collaboration uh, with the robust correlative science. So uh, that uh, trial has an endpoint as pathologic complete response. Meanwhile, Olaparib again became uh, evident in breast cancer. The Olympia and Olympiad trials have been uh, testing uh, Olaparib and BRCA associated early and late stage breast cancer, and the Olympiad trial has completed accrual. And Talazoparib is being tested in uh, BRCA associated metastatic breast cancer compared to treatment of physician's choice, a common type of therapy in this uh, population. Uh, and there are some combination studies uh, going on across the board with different PARP inhibitors. Uh, one last area of great interest, I think, with PARP inhibitors now is that uh, there um, may be some uh, reason to combine PARP inhibitors with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Of course, we're all very interested in immunotherapy and immune checkpoint inhibitors, and I myself have presented data in ER-positive disease with pembrolizumab. Uh, but there is an on, a new study, Phase one 2 trial, looking at a PARP inhibitor uh, that is being combined with a checkpoint inhibitor, and I think that uh, that will be very, very intriguing data as there are preclinical data to suggest that this may be a synergistic combination. Of course, we've been really interested to understand which patients who have sporadic triple negative breast cancer could respond to a PARP inhibitor. Uh, we know that patients with uh, BRCA mutations may, and probably some of the new mutations that are associated with defects in DNA repair that are also germline, may, uh, those patients may also respond. Um, we understand that, for example, methylation uh, may uh, block response to PARP inhibitors, as can mutations that restore function of BRCA, which have been reported as well. But what about the patients with sporadic triple negative breast cancer? There's been a lot of interest in using uh, DNA repair defect assays, one assay called homologous recombination defect that's being uh, worked on by Myriad. Uh, and unfortunately, so far, that hasn't really been a predictor of response to drugs like carboplatin that are DNA damaging in the metastatic setting seen in the TNT trial. Uh, but there is a lot of work going on in the neoadjuvant setting to try and see whether or not uh, this, this kind of assay will predict benefit from DNA damaging agents, and it's being used in the PARP inhibitor trials as well. And then other work is going on looking for a brachinus like signature that may help us to move forward with PARP inhibitors in the sporadic triple negative population. Dr. Rugo, during the International Cancer Congress, you presented a keynote address on personalized precision cancer treatment. So do you think it's the future of cancer therapy? So I talked at uh, this, uh, this International Congress about precision medicine, so-called precision medicine. Many people think of it as synonymous with personalized medicine, although it's a little bit different. Uh, but I focused really specifically on breast cancer, where uh, I think that, you know, we still have a long way to go. Uh, but there are some examples of where we're already using uh, precision medicine and where it has failed. I think, you know, we understand now, based on a number of different trials, including a recent trial looking at uh, circulating tumor DNA and plasma, that PI3 kinase mutations don't predict response to mTOR inhibition, for example. On the same, uh, in the same meeting at ASCO 2016, we saw data that suggested that potentially PI3 kinase mutations might predict response instead to uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors, certainly to the pan-specific inhibitors, which were sort of being discontinued due to toxicity. Uh, and lack of efficacy, but uh, more importantly to the sort of up-and-coming alpha-specific inhibitors or the alpha-delta inhibitor that's uh, being tested, alpelisib and tocilisib, respectively. 
Uh, so that I think that you know you're seeing sort of a failure and success at the same time. And then we saw some interesting data also about uh, ESR1 or the estrogen receptor uh, mutations uh, defined in uh, circulating tumor uh, plasma DNA. Uh, and showing that that might predict resistance to AIs, aromatase inhibitors, but not to fulvestrant, and that it doesn't predict resistance to uh, cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor uh, palbociclib when it's combined with fulvestrant, and that data is published in Lancet Oncology by Tuck. So I think that we've seen sort of examples on in all ends. There are a number of case reports in the literature and presented that suggest that in a one-off setting in a single patient, you might be able to find a mutation that when you target it uh, results in at least short-term responses. Um, and some of the, those uh, kinds of examples include somatic mutations of HER2, which exist in maybe 2% of the population. Uh, there are a number of basket trials uh, that are looking at, you know, defining a mutation and then treating a patient based on that defined mutation, both in the metastatic and the neoadjuvant setting which I think are quite intriguing. Uh, in the metastatic setting, I think we've been challenged by rapid tumor progression uh, and multiple mechanisms of resistance. Uh, so, yeah, I do think, you know, precision medicine is the future, but uh, we still have a long way to go compared to some of the other malignancies where there aren't effective treatment options, and this really represented a huge uh, breakthrough. In uh, breast cancer, I think we're still sort of making small incremental advances, but we are making advances. Dr. Rogo, the American Society of Clinical Oncology Expert Panel recently published recommendations regarding endocrine therapy for hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. Can you please shed some light on these recommendations? Yes, we uh, we actually uh, had a panel pulled together as part of the ASCO American Society of Clinical Oncology's uh, effort to uh, produce guidelines. And the guidelines have changed a little bit recently in that they now really focus on uh, specific disease groups, so ER-positive metastatic breast cancer treated with hormone therapy or chemotherapy or HER2-positive therapy, early-stage breast cancer, premenopausal, not premenopausal. So ours was pre- and postmenopausal women, metastatic e hormone receptor-positive breast cancer treated with hormone therapy. And it actually was really interesting to work on this because there are so many new drugs coming in that are showing improvements in progression-free survival. Of course, the mTOR inhibitor, Everolimus, and now the CDK4-6 inhibitors uh, that we added in, and of course, the uh, relative failure of the PAN-PI3 kinase inhibitor, buparlosib. I think the most important thing to take out of these guidelines is that we strongly recommended that in patients who don't have life-threatening organ dysfunction, that hormone sequential hormone therapy be the first, second, third uh, approach to treatment, and that we delay the uh, start of chemotherapy until absolutely necessary. Thank you, Dr. Rugo, for speaking with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. To stay updated on our latest scale videos and interviews, please follow us on Twitter, like us on our Facebook page and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Happy Dogplexing!